Okay guys, I hope you had a good break. We are going to dive into the first half of module six, which will be pages 207 to 220. And we're gonna be talking about changes in matter and chemical reactions. And basically your whole life, right? Um, you have learned a lot about compounds, whether you know it or not, and how they behave in nature just by being around it. So what do you know about water, right? You probably already know, but water can have three forms. It can be a solid, it can be ice, it can be a liquid, it can be water, and it can also be a gas, a steam, right? Um, so basically, things can change from one form to another, right? And what happens, let's say you have ice and then you heat it up, it's gonna become liquid. And when you have liquid and you heat it up or add heat, comes steam, right? Let's think about something else. Um, maybe something you have for breakfast. Think about an egg. What happens when you fry an egg? You take an egg, you crack it into the pan. It's a liquid. When you fry it, it becomes a solid. Add more heat. Does that then turn in back into a liquid or does that turn into steam? No. Well, why? Well, this module is going to walk you through that, right? So you've learned in this class how elements are groups of collected atoms, and you've also learned compounds are groups of collected molecules, right? And what molecules look like along with their shapes, the periodic properties of the elements when you look at the periodic table, and you've, you've just built on that and learned a lot of things. So now we're going to look at the different ways matter can change um, and particularly when we're talking about chemical reactions, okay? All right, so we're going to talk about classifying changes that occur in matter. Okay, so there are two ways to classify how matter changes. There's a chemical change and a physical change. A chemical change is a change that affects the type of molecules or atoms in a substance, while a physical change is a change in which the atoms or molecules in a substance stay the same, okay? So um, we're gonna talk about some different examples, but if you were to have a log and you were to chop it into small pieces, would that be a physical change or a chemical change? Well, hopefully you said physical change because it's still log molecules. It's just that they aren't, um, they aren't in the same large piece, right? They're, okay. What happens when you, let's say you have that log and you light it on fire? Is that going to be a physical change or a chemical change? Well, that's going to be a chemical change because you no longer have log molecules, if you think about it that way. They're, they're ash, carbon dioxide, water vapor, all of those things. Okay, what about if you take sugar and you dissolve it in water? Is that going to be a physical change or a chemical change? Even though the sugar molecules are no longer visible to you because they dissolved in the water, they're still present. Well, how do you know they're still present? What happens if you drink it? If you drink it, are you going to know that there's sugar in that water? Yes. They're just going to be broken up into smaller bits when they're dissolved. So this is going to be a physical change. Okay. Just a moment ago, we talked about frying an egg. Okay. Is that going to be a physical change? or a chemical change. Think about it. Both white and yolk go from being a liquid to a solid. They change color a bit. So, All right, so you have a liquid egg, you heat it up, you fry it, it becomes solid. You can't uncook this egg, right? It was a chemical change. It altered the original molecules of the raw egg. So what I want you to think about when you're thinking about chemical and physical changes is think about if that change can be reversed, and this will help you in determining if it's physical or chemical. Physical changes can usually be reversed pretty easily. Chemical changes are not easily reversed. Some chemical changes can be reversed, it just takes another chemical reaction to do it, but it's oftentimes difficult, okay? So think of that methodology, think of that idea, when you're trying to decipher if it's chemical or physical. Okay, I wanna talk really quick about experiment 6.1. We are not 
doing this one per se, but I want to go over what happens and it's distinguishing between chemical and physical changes. Okay. So a couple things. Um, one thing is basically taking an egg and removing the shell from it. And there's a couple different ways you can do it, but you can put an egg, a raw egg in vinegar and let it sit overnight. Another one is you can take some toilet bowl cleaner. It has to be some special cleaner and you, it's a strong acid basically. And when you put the egg into this toilet bowl cleaner, the acid reacts with the calcium carbonate shell of the egg and it's chemically, it chemically breaks it down. Okay. So it's a chemical reaction and it breaks it into calcium chloride, water, carbon dioxide. And so you'll start to see bubbling happening. Um, and basically you let it sit and then eventually over time it completely removes the egg, the hard eggshell from the outside of the egg. Now the egg's not going to be a complete mess. It's still going to be held together because there's a thin membrane just inside that shell. And while we didn't do it just now, I'm going to insert a picture so you can see what it would look like. And basically, is this a reverse, can you reverse this? Once you take the eggshell off of the egg, is this a reversible process? No, okay, it's not. Um, another thing in this experiment is that you take some water, you fill it to the 25 milliliter mark, and then you put that graduated cylinder with the water in, in it into the freezer. And then you let it sit for a long time, okay? overnight, 12 hours, something like that. And then when you take out the water, what's happening? Well, it's frozen, right? That you expect that. But what else do you notice if, if you do this? You'll notice the level of ice is higher than the mark that you made when you put it into the freezer, okay? So the volume has increased. Water is unique in this way, okay? Water is a unique substance that in the solid form, it actually takes up more space than as, than as a liquid form, all right? Most substances in the world take up less space as a solid than as a liquid, but not water, okay? So you, you need to know this. Now, now think about this. Um, is this reversible? Yes, right? Phase changes are physical changes and they are reversible. All right. So All right. when a substance changes from solid to liquid or vice versa, liquid to solid, or when it changes from liquid to gas or vice versa, gas to liquid, these are what's called phase changes. Okay. So, um, these are physical changes, and these types of physical changes are called phase changes, like ice, adding heat, making a liquid, adding heat, making a gas. These are physical changes that are phase changes. The major part of these changes involve the addition or removal of energy, okay? All right, so when you add heat to a liquid, you're going to get right here, the gas right? When you remove energy from a gas, you're going to get a liquid. When you remove energy from a liquid, you're going to get a solid. So this kind of tells you what happens when you add energy, add heat, and remove heat, okay? Solid, liquid, gas are the three states of matter, and they're called phases. This is why the changes between the states are called phase changes, and these all represent physical changes, okay? So molecules or atoms involved are not chemically altered. They're the same molecules, just with more or less energy. Okay, now we're gonna do experiment 6.2. The materials for this experiment calls for an empty milk jug, water, small pot, stove, hot pads, and safety goggles. And we have safety goggles, hot pads. I'm gonna use my stove. I have an empty milk jug, but instead of using a small pot, we're gonna use a kettle. And I already have the water in there because it's going to be easier to transfer. All right. And the question that this experiment is asking is, do gases take up more volume than liquids? 
and you need to take a moment and write down your hypothesis for what you think that's going to be. Okay guys, so what I've done is I've taken about three cups of water, I have put it in my kettle, and now I am waiting for it to boil on my stove. All right, so now you can tell that my water is boiling, my kettle is whistling, and you can see the steam coming out. So now I'm going to remove the kettle. I'm going to remove the kettle and now I'm going to add my water to the milk jug. I'm gonna wait till I see some steam come out of the milk jug. Do you guys see it? Yep, and then I'm going to close it tightly. Now we're going to watch the milk jug. And see what we notice. So you should see some dumpling right there occurring. That was not there before. Let's see if I can see it anywhere else. It's the biggest spot I notice it right now. Right here and right here. It's dimpling, which means the jug is collapsing in on itself. All right, so I paused, I paused my video and came back um, just a short while later, and you can see that the jug has more dimpling right there. Okay guys, so I waited a little bit longer and now I want you to look at the jug. So you've got this side that's collapsing in on itself. I hope you can see that in the video. Then you have this side, which is also collapsing in on itself if I turn it right, you can see that. And then you've got some happening on this side. So you can see that the jug is absolutely collapsing in on itself in this experiment. Okay, and now you see that this jug is extremely collapsed. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a good picture. I'm not gonna go over exactly what just happened in this experiment because you guys have a lab report on it, but I will tell you that your book does a really great job right here. So I would highly recommend understanding that um, before writing your lab report. All right, we're gonna jump in to the kinetic theory of matter, the relationship between the speed and temperature of molecules. Okay, so right now you're probably sitting or standing. Um, you're most likely, let's say you're sitting on the ground, okay? So you might think that the ground you're sitting on is still, or the chair that you're in, but what you need to know is that there's molecules in your seat that are moving around super, super quick. And all of those molecules and atoms um, are constantly in motion, okay? This is the basis for the kinetic theory of matter right here. So you know that atoms and molecules are very small, right? So when you're looking at your chair or whatever you're seated in, um, you're looking at tons and tons and tons of atoms and molecules moving around in random directions, right? Now you don't see that because they're so small. When a material like a chair is in the solid phase, it doesn't do look like it's doing anything, right? It just looks like it's motionless. And that's because each individual molecule that moves one direction, another molecule moves in the opposite, another direction. So the solid matter can't actually go anywhere or move because all the ad atoms and molecules making it up, they're all moving in different directions, okay? That's the big concept to understand 
when you're thinking of a solid phase. And this is something that we'll build on in future modules. I'll refer back to it often. Okay, so now when you're thinking about liquid, a liquid phase, molecules and atoms don't just vibrate. They can move around, okay? So um, if you put a drop of food coloring into a glass of water, have you ever done that? What happens? Well, slowly but surely, it eventually becomes completely whatever color that you dropped into it, right? That food coloring, that color distributes throughout that glass. And why? Well, that's because those food, the food coloring molecules are bumped into by the water molecules, right? And they all move around randomly till they're spread out throughout the class. Okay. So molecules move in a certain direction until they hit another molecule or in that glass, if they hit the glass, the side of the glass, then they'll bounce off into another direction until they collide with another molecule or the other side of the glass. So one way to think about this is like pool, uh, pool balls, cue balls on a pool table, right? Okay, now in the gas phase, the atoms and molecules behave like the ones in the liquid, but the molecules move around at a faster speed. So they collide with other things less, less often because the atoms and molecules are farther apart from each other, okay? So regardless of the phase, solid, liquid, gas, atoms and molecules are in some type of random motion. Now, because motion requires work and work requires energy, the molecules and atoms of a substance have to have energy in order to move around. So the higher the temperature of the material, the faster the molecules move. The faster the molecules move, the further they get from each other. Okay? So I think I was on that, I was showing the last page when I was talking about this. So I just wanna make sure that you guys see this diagram kind of just gone over it. All right, so when temperature increases, molecules or atoms of that, steps, of that substance will absorb the energy. And so they will move faster and they'll get further apart and eventually they will change phases, okay? So that's why when you have a solid and then you have a temperature increase, eventually it will change to a liquid. And if you have a liquid and you have a temperature increase, it will eventually change to a gas. So the temperature at which a substance changes from solid to liquid is the melting point of that substance, okay? And the temperature at which a substance changes from a liquid to a gas is called the boiling point. Okay, conversely, when a substance experiences a decrease in the temperature, right? So now think oppositely. Energy leaves the molecules and atoms and moves into the surroundings. That's because heat always moves from a hot body to a cold body, right? So as molecules lose more and more energy, what's gonna happen to their motion? Well, as they lose energy, it's going to decrease, right? So they're not gonna get farther away, they're gonna get closer to their neighbors. And that is gonna, the effect of that is gonna be a gas condensing to a liquid or a liquid freezing to a solid, okay? All right, so now we're gonna do experiment 6.3. The purpose of this experiment is to learn the relationship between the speed and temperature of molecules. So I am going to do two mason jars. I have some food coloring. I'm gonna go ahead and use my kettle. I have my stove, my hot pad, my safety goggles. And the question that you're asking is, do molecules move faster at higher temperatures? And then you're gonna write down your hypothesis and then we're gonna keep All right, so my water's done boiling. So I'm going to take it off the stove and I'm going to fill my mason jar halfway. And then I'm going to wait a few minutes and All come right, guys, back. So I'm back and you have the cold tap water on the left and you have the boiling tap water on the right. And now what I'm gonna do is drop the food coloring in Just gonna watch it for a bit. And what you should see is you, you see that in the 
boiling water, the food coloring is being distributed much more rapidly than in the cold water. All right, so what's happening here? The color is being distributed much more rapidly in the hot water, okay? So this is an excellent illustration of the kinetic theory of matter. So the molecules in the cold water are moving, but not nearly as fast as those in the hot water. So when the food coloring was added to both jars, the water molecules be began colliding with the molecules in the food coloring, right? And this begins spreading out the molecules in the food coloring within the jar. But since the molecules, the water molecules in the hot water were moving much faster than those in the cold water, the food coloring spread out much more quickly. Okay? Okay, so to just sum up real quick, the kinetic theory of matter, it's when molecules and atoms are in constant motion. Okay? We talked about that. The higher the temperature, the greater their speed's going to be. That's the big overarching concept that you need to know. Okay, I want to jump and talk about density. Density is an object's mass divided by the volume that that object occupies. Okay, and it's going to be, where's my units right here? Um, so you can have grams over milliliters, but also that is grams over centimeters cubed, okay? So density is really important in chemistry because it tells us how packed the atoms or molecules of a substance are. So if they're tightly packed or loosely packed, um, let's say you have two balls, okay? And one is plastic and one is lead. Let's say they're the same size, let's say they're the same color, can you tell the difference between those two balls just by looking? No. But can you tell the difference if you were to pick them up? Yes. How would you be able to tell the difference? Well, the lead one is clearly going to be heavier than the plastic one, right? Because matter and lead is very dense. It's very, very tightly packed together as compared to the less dense, less packed plastic ball, right? Um, so the density for lead is 11.4 grams per milliliter, whereas most plastic, it's less than one, okay? So something to know is that every material in creation has a specific density, and this helps us identify unknown substances, right? If you have a chart that tells you all these densities and you figure out what a substance density is, then you can figure out what that substance is, okay? All right, now we're gonna be doing experiment 6.4, which is comparing the density of liquids. So how do we qualitative, qualitatively and quantitatively determine the density of liquids? So they want you to think about the densities of maple syrup, vegetable oil, and water, and make a hypothesis on what you think is gonna be the most dense in the middle and the least dense. Here's gonna be our supplies right here. I have my scale, I have a graduated cylinder, I've got some distilled water, I have some syrup, I have vegetable oil, a tall glass, and some safety. So bottles. the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take a measurement of our graduated cylinder so we know how much it weighs. And it weighs 30.9 grams, so I'm gonna write that down. All right, so now I am going to pour 50 milliliters of syrup into this graduated cylinder. All right, now that I have 50.0 milliliters of syrup. I'm going to take a measurement and I get 96.5 grams. And then I'm going to subtract out what my cylinder weighs. And I'm 
going to get 65.6 grams. And then to get my density of my syrup, we know that it's mass over volume, right? So it's going to be 65.6 grams over 50.0 milliliter. All right, and then after I calculate that out, I get my density of the syrup. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour my syrup into this tall glass. And then I'm going to rinse out my graduated cylinder so that we can repeat this with the water and vegetable. Eat the experiment, but we're going to use water this time. I get 79.7. I'm going to subtract my mass of my graduated cylinder. Okay, so then when I work it out, I'm going to get 48.8 grams for my water. I'm going to divide to get the density and I get one. I'm going to pour my water into my tall glass. And I'm going to repeat the experiment with vegetable oil. And I overshot it a little bit, so I need to pour a tiny bit out. All right, now I'm gonna get my mass. And I get 76.3. I'm gonna subtract out and do my calculation. I'll be right back. Okay, so then I calculated it out. Um, because of significant figures, I had to put both these densities at 1.0. But if you were to look at the smaller numbers, you can see that clearly the oil has the lowest, followed by the water, followed by the syrup. So now I'm gonna pour my oil in. And I'm gonna see what happens. Okay, and what you should see, what's going on with this layering is the density, right? So which substance has the largest density? It's gonna be the one that's on the bottom. It's the syrup, and that's what we measured it to be. Which one has the smallest density and is at the top of the glass? That's gonna be the oil. Which one's in the middle? That's gonna be the water. Okay, so hopefully this experiment shows you how you can both um, see densities and compare them to each other, but also how you can calculate. All right, so I wanna talk about the on your own problems right here, 6.4, 6.5, 6.6. So 6.4, cubes of frozen rubbing alcohol are put into liquid rubbing alcohol. Will the cubes float or sink? Okay, and I wrote the answer out right here. Well, we know that all substances except water occupy less volume when they're in the solid phase than the liquid, okay? So frozen cubes of alcohol would be more dense than when it's in the liquid, okay? So frozen alcohol would sink in liquid alcohol because it's more dense. All right, 6.5. The density of silver is 10.5 grams per centimeters cubed. A jeweler makes a silver bracelet out of 0 0.200 kilograms of silver. What's the bracelet's volume in milliliters? Okay, so to solve this problem, I know the density of silver right here, and I know that I have a silver bracelet. And I know that my formula is density equals mass over volume. So if I rearrange it, I get volume equals mass over density. So that's exactly what I do. I change my mass from kilograms to grams. So I just multiply it by 1,000, and I'm going to get 2.00 times 10 to the second grams because of sig figs. And then I divide it by the density of silver, 10.5 grams per centimeters cubed, and I get 19.0 centimeters cubed, which is also the same as 19.0 milliliters. All right. 
6.6. A gold miner tries to sell some gold that is found in a nearby river. The person who's thinking about purchasing the gold measures the mass and volume of a nugget. The mass is 1.56 kilograms and the volume is 0 0.081 liters. Is this nugget really made of gold? Remember, the density of gold is 19.3 grams per milliliter. Okay, so in order to get the density of this substance, I take the mass divided by the volume, but I need it in the correct units. So I take 1.56 kilograms and I change it to grams, okay? That's what I'm gonna insert right here. Then I divide by my volume, but I need to change it to milliliters. So I'm going to multiply it by 1,000. So when I take my numbers and I divide, then I'm gonna get 19 point, with considering significant figures, you have to round this up to three, 19.3 grams per milliliter. Yes, it is gold. Remember, they told us that's the density for gold. Okay. Okay, guys, so for the second half of this lecture, last year I created a video for the chemistry kids in my class. So instead of recreating it, I'm just going to have a link to it here so you can finish out the rest of the module. Just know that specific comments I make were for that class, not for you guys. If you have any questions, let me know, but hopefully this gives you everything you need. I did upload the quiz to the website, so you can also take that. After you watch this video and complete your test, do the quiz and then complete your lab report. And that should be everything that you need to turn in to me. Good luck.